here's the uh, chapter 13, logistic mm. regression. We're going to, this is the part of the book where we're going to talk about generalized linear models. I don't think it's an official like new part, but is it? I mean, it it's kind of it's, it's kind of implicit that once you get into like non optimal outcomes, yeah. it's like you're you're entered into the the broader GLM world, G, you know, whatever. Yeah, that's what. So this is part three of the book. The book has, I think, five parts overall. But part three is general linearized models. Part four is I'm looking forward to that just to kind of to ramble a little bit. But um, yeah. part four is all about before and after fitting, which is some really good nuts and bolts stuff. Yeah, it's only two chapters, but it should be good. And then I guess there's six parts, but the last part, part six, is just, you know, kind of like a what comes next thing. And that's not, not, it's just one chapter. So, oh yeah, yeah. part five is causal. Huh? I said it right this time, causal inference. Causal, not causal. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. That's yeah, no, this, this is all good stuff. It's kind of funny though. It's like, um, you know, um, it, <laughs> I, I, you know, I had owned this book for over a year before we started reading it, just because, you know, like you yeah. do, you buy the book and you sit on it. But I mean, it, it really is in some ways, like it's a standard sort of, you know, more like advanced modeling yeah. kind of treatise, but really the, the focus on Bayesian stuff is really what, you can't really like put a price on that or, you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, that isn't, it's not really like implicit in the, at least, I don't know, like when you buy it, you know, you think, oh, you, you don't realize you're, you're making, you're getting a Bayesian book, but that's cool. Well, I mean, in my opinion, it's not truly a Bayesian book. He, like in the beginning, he says, look, I'm going to use Bayesian models, but it's not, I'm not really focused on the Bayesian interpretation of probability. He's just focused on it as a tool. Like he keeps saying over and over again, the big advantage of the Bayesian, well, there's two big advantages. One, it lets you use priors, which he thinks mm -hmm. is the best advantage to like inform your thing. In fact, there's, uh, there's an example in this chapter for that, if you remember, and I'll go over that. Uh, where that plays a role. Another one, of course, is the simulation aspect where you get draws from the posterior. So you can say more things about their coefficients than just their mm -hmm. deviation. Like what's their correlation? You can understand them better. So that's kind of, I think that's what, I don't want to put words in. You know, You're know. right. It's not, it's not a Bayesian book, but certainly it is like, it is, it has that thrust where we're not looking at. I people. actually like that he you does know. it in a way. It's like, hey, you know, this is just a tool and really you should be using it. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. yeah. I have actually been using it in my work. Yeah, I hope to we'll talk about that sometime. So this chapter is about the logistic regression. And again, it's the first simplest uh, generalized linear model. Now you both, you and I were in the Bayes Rules Club, so we're familiar with, um, with logistic regression. But he does take a few interesting turns in this chapter that I had not seen before from the previous experience, which I did like. So in fact, so mainly the first thing is just to introduce the logistic regression. That should be straightforward. Learning to interpret the coefficients. That was an interesting section that kind of taught me some new things, which I hope I can remember. And then this latent data formulation, I thought was actually really interesting because I always kind of wondered about how, if there was a way to do that. It turns out, yeah, there is. And uh, what, are the, what, the, what the issue is with doing that is kind of interesting too, with uh, what he calls a non-identifiability issue. So that I thought was probably the highlight for me for this chapter. And it turns out I did look ahead and in later chapters, he does use this latent data formulation again for something else. So for a, for a ordered categorical variable, he uses that. That's like in chapter 15 or something. I guess that'll be my chapter. So I'm gonna get to come back to that. Yeah, no, ordered, um, ordered, like multi ordered, like um, categorical variables are, are, are really hot right now, and especially in medicine. Oh, okay. Well, hey, here you go. Look forward to yeah. chapter 15 then. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so what is logistic regression? Well, the basic idea is that you have this function, the log logit function or the log odds function, as we called it in, the, in Bayes rules, right? And it's a function that maps from zero to one, zero to one to minus infinity to infinity. And it's that mapping that's useful for doing this logistic regression. Um, in a particular case, it turns out, I, which I thought was interesting, in this chapter you learn it's actually not critically important what the form of this function is. It's just that it has this mapping property. And the inverse function is the, he calls the logit inverse, but it's also called a sigmoid function, as you know, is this function that maps from uh, minus infinity to infinity to zero to one. And that is what kind of enables us to do regression for a outcome that has two, uh, for a uh, outcome that has two values, zero and one, for example, right? And so we're gonna, our, our, we're gonna be able to uh, do a linear regression, get a real number, and then turn that real number into a probability with this, with this uh, mapping function. Um, he points out that the if you want to, if you're looking for the logit function in the inverse, whoops, I spelled that wrong, which is fine. Inverse logit function in R, it's uh, 
the there's a distribution called the logistic distribution in R, and the cumulative distribution function of that is the um, inverse logic. Or, or sorry, is the um, yeah inverse logic function, right? It's P logis, and the, the in, and the quantiles of that are, is this logic function. So that's the easy way to get those two functions rather than defining them yourself in R. Which I actually was not aware of. I've been constantly just defining them myself over and over again. I was not aware that they were, that they were I actually did not know that there was such a thing as a logistic distribution with something else I learned. And I knew about the function, but I never knew there's actually a probability distribution associated with it. But of course there would be because it's a it's a cumulative, it's a cumulative distribution function. It has the right properties. It maps from minus infinity to, to infinity to zero to one. So I just never realized it before. Hmm. Anyway, this mapping lets us add to our toolkit this idea of a, a linear regression expand what we can do with linear regressions into models with two outcomes by just having this model where the probability of the outcome is equal to the inverse logic of uh, your linear regression, you know, where X is your, your predictors and beta is your vector of uh, um, coefficients, right? So just a quick example of that. And this example will come back at the end too. And this is this a national election data. It has a lot of columns in it. <laughs> Most mm -hmm. of them, I could not figure out what they even are. But in this example, he just pulls out a couple of columns. One of them is the preference for uh, Bush over Clinton in 19, uh, and also we only, it has a lot of years in it. He only pulls out 1992. So he wants to look at the impact of income on your preference for Bush, basically, over Clinton. So Y equals one is you like Bush, okay, in the 1992 election. And so this code just pulls that data out. It's not important to look at. There's one interesting line here where we filter out only the people that had a preference, oh, preference for either Bush or Clinton, not some other preference or not no preference. And when we do that, we find uh, that there is 477 people who in that poll preferred uh, Clinton and 702 that preferred um, no, sorry, preferred 477 the preferred Bush and 702 the preferred Clinton in that poll. That's kind of the median result where, without looking at the income at all. Um, not the median result, but the independent result. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna do a logistic regression. And so how we do that is use stand GLM like we've been using all along. The only difference, so we're gonna do vote versus income. The only difference is you just put this family thing in. Um, this makes SIT, logistic makes it a logistic regression. Actually, you don't need this link logic. That's the default. Uh, this makes it. <laughs> I know, it makes it. <laughs> yeah, it's good. I like that. Typing too fast. Uh, and that's basically the only difference, right? Oh, by the way, I pulled this stuff out of um, the tidy Ross. Uh, yeah, that's been it's called. been really good, hasn't it? Yeah. So I mean, I, I been a great resource. Modified it, but I basically just pulled it right out of there. Um, so you do that fit and you find the intercept is minus 1.5 and the, and the slope for the income is 0 0.3. Now these are all on the log scales, uh, logic scales, sorry. So these immediately, uh, you know, defy a quick interpretation, <laughs> right? You're like, okay, whatever that means. I mean, the only interpretation you might get out of that is, well, the income seems to have some effect. It's, you know, outside of the one standard deviation anyway on their preference, but what exactly uh, the effect of an increase in, oh, this is, did we divide by, I guess we didn't divide by 100K in this for the income, or is it already, oh no, the income, sorry, I think it's something else. The income here is just the scale of, I didn't mention this, but this income on here is just a scale of one, two, three, four, and five. Um, I don't know what those mean in terms of actual income. Five is more income, I guess. Uh, I couldn't find that answer. I did find where this data comes from, but it's like, you got to read a big code book or anything. I didn't, I, you're muted, Ryan, if you're saying something. Are you I I think it's just it's a um it's just like a it's like a Likert type or categorical way of, of doing the income. I, I, yeah, I he wrote about this, like why it's sometimes better. But you I know we're just doing a direct regression on it. We're not treating it as <laughs> categorical. We're just like, you know, what you know, one two is twice as much income as one, apparently, whatever. That, that yeah, that's, that's so, but I'm not sure about the whether that's a good thing or I mean I wouldn't do that normally without having a little more justification but just for this example it's fine right yeah and so this is a plot of that uh the best fit line note that it's got i extended the plot out past the one if i just so you can see that the sigmoid nature of the curve even then it's kind of subtle because it's pretty flat in the mm -hmm. regime here um where the actual income levels are 
And these circles are the, uh, in that each level, how many people were um, Bush, uh, Republican versus Democrat supporters needs just, just meant to hint how it works. But you can see like in the low end when the probability of voting Republican is very low uh, for low income, it was the case for the actual people in the survey that had low income, they did prefer uh, Clinton. And then it kind of just, these other ones all look relatively equal to me. So I don't know, but they're mm -hmm. close to 50%. So I guess that makes sense, right? At the top one is like 55%. The, well, down here, there might be a little bit more preference for the, uh, the circle looks a little bigger. So, so it looks like if I were uh, roughly interpret this, I see the lowest incomes uh, probably preferred Clinton, which makes some sense. And the higher incomes were kind of a coin toss really. Hmm. But that's kind of a rough interpretation there. Uh, let's see. One thing I did a little differently as I thought would be interesting is like put in the actual frag rather than looking at dots, we can just calculate the fraction in each of these categories that voted for um, or that preferred Bush versus Clinton, including a little error bar, just calculated directly right from the counts. Right. And, and I put also on top of that this best fit line also with its error bars. So you can see that model actually does seem to uh, agree pretty well with the with the actual data. Yeah. From that point of view. This is something I think is a good idea to do. I don't know if you mentioned this maybe in the next chapter, but uh, when you, if you have a continuous va variable, right, you do a logistic regression, sometimes it's hard to compare, right? Because you'll have like a bunch of, you know, zeros and a bunch of ones. You don't know how to compare your logistic curve to that, but you can just, you can, what you can do for plotting purposes, you can bin your continuous variable and then calculate the fractions of each bin and plot dots like this and kind of see, oh, does it make sense or not? Just as a, as a, uh, you know, what do you call mm -hmm. it? A quick test. Yeah. So that's the example just to kick things off. Now he goes into uh, section 13.2 uh, talking about interpreting these coefficients. Um, the most important thing to recognize is that because you're using little is this logistic function that nonlinear is gonna impact, uh, it, you know, the impact that you get from changing a predictor is gonna depend on where you evaluate those functions because it's a nonlinear curve. Uh, he uses, he recommends using the averages of the predictors as a useful start. So for example, if you want to look at the intercept, well, intercept is zero income is not used, not interesting here. It's not even a, not even a proper, uh, there's nothing that has zero income in the data. So he evaluates at the mean income, whatever that was, I don't remember what it was actually. Oh, it was near three, it was like 3.1 or something like that. Um, and he evaluates the value of that curve at the mean income and you get 40%, you know, 0.401, that's 40%. So that's that's kind of like the intercept that moved recentered at the mean. Yeah. Um, and then he says, okay, um, at at the income equals, um, what does it say, different thing? Oh, that's, what does it say? Why does that say that? Huh? Yeah, what does it say? I don't know what this 0.33 means. That's not 0.33, so who knows what that means? No worries. Uh, anyway, you, by the way, are you using Bookdown to do this? No, just Markdown. Oh, okay. Oh, no, yeah. I guess it is Bookdown. It is Bookdown. It's the repo. I just pulled the repo and edited it. So it, mm. it, it is Bookdown. You're right. I don't know much about Bookdown. It just is Bookdown. I know how to edit Markdown files. So. Sure. <laughs> Our Markdown files. So. Um, what was I going to say? I remember. Oh, you were talking about the intercept, I think? Or, or maybe? We did the intercept. So now if you want to look at the slope, we can look at the uh, difference in uh, like one, you know, difference of one income step near the mean income. Okay. So that we're near the mean part. And that's about where the 50% probability is too, right? And we find that for one step in income from two to three, in fact, I just calculate that it's a 7.4%, uh, about 7% increase in uh, probability of voting for Bush, right? So there is some impact. That's basically the impact at the average income. The impact's less at the extremes because of the way, in general, is less at the extremes because of the way the logic curve works. In this case, it turns out it's not very big effect because this, we're, as you saw in the previous curve, it's pretty flat, pretty flat for the whole region of incomes. Yeah. And then comes this idea, this divide by four rule, which is kind of cool. Uh, the concept there is simply that the slope of the sigmoid function at the mean at 50%, sorry, I should say at p equals 50% is uh, just the coefficient beta over four. So you can, you can just, as a rule of thumb, if your probabilities are near half, um, 
you can use this rule of four to get a quick estimate of the effect of any particular coefficient on probability, right? Without having to go through the nonlinear mapping use, using this approximation, basically linearizing the logistic function at, at, at the highest slope. It's also anywhere, you can treat it also as an upper bound, right? It can't be more than this. <laughs> Whatever the impact of this predictor is, it can't be more than beta over four and the slope over four. And in this case, we find that the, this, that same coefficient divided by four is 8%. So it's a little bit higher than what it was here, but it's with, you know, obviously uh, very close, right? So that's the rule of four. It's a very useful. I didn't, I've never heard of this rule. Of I, I, it's kind of like that dividing by two or whatever. Yeah. Uh, thing that we did. Yeah, it was kind of wild. So I don't know if I'll put, be able to get that one tattooed in my brain, but I hope I can because it seems useful. <laughs> Probably in a mother like rule of four. I don't know what you're talking about. Four beers? What, what is it? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so that's a good upper, upper bound. Uh, we can also calculate a posterior confidence on that, um, that same beta. So we can take the same beta, but use a posterior interval function. And we can see that our confidence interval on that increase of one uh, income category is somewhere between six and 10% or yeah, 10%, 11%. Cool. So that's basically, a, you know, the main part of the interpreting the coefficients. Cool. Basically the trick is you just have to keep in mind that you're in this, you have this logistic function thing and, and map yourself back to that space. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about predictions and comparisons as well. Um, predictions are now remember that the these these packages have several different predict functions now the main function predict predict the normal one is that all these all the tidy and not tidy all the R uh, fitting and modeling things has it all implement this s3 generic predict right and so the s3 generic in this case does see I sound smart now I know what s3 generics are <laughs> You have to say with confidence though, this is an S3 generic. If you don't know what that is, I don't know why you're even in this class. Get out of here. <laughs> That'd be a terrible teacher. Any event, uh, the predict function just returns the average um, value for the prediction, right? The average probability if you put response. So the trick here is to put type equals response. So you get it, get it so it already does, takes care of the inverse uh, logic thing for you, right? And calculates the um, probability. But it's, so here I just calculate uh, for here. Oh, so here I set up a new, it's what, what about income equals five? What do you predict for income equal five? I just put in the model. I say, I want a response, new data equals new. It spits out 56%. It's basically the same as if I just used the model directly, the coefficient, right? Uh, and put in a five, I get 55%. It's not exactly the same though, because this is actually taking the mean of all the, all the, um, all the draws, right? And so because of the nonlinear, there could be, there'll be a slight difference. Here, the difference is extremely slight because as I said before, it's very linear throughout this regime for this particular example. But in other examples, it could be, it could be different by a larger amount. So that's what predict does. The second one we could talk about is posterior lin predict. Um, that one draw, returns now samples of a linear prediction. So I'm using the same uh, five, income equals five, and I ask for a linear prediction. And I get 4,000, because that's how many draws the uh, Monte Carlo Markov chain did, 4,000 samples of what the um, linear prediction, by, and linear prediction means without doing the inverse logic, essentially, just the beta times, all the betas times five, essentially, right? <laughs> all the possible betas from the Monte Carlo Markov chain, which I should have plotted those out, it might've been interesting. So that's not very useful. Probably better is this posterior E predict, I don't know what the E means, but, um, it puts it, basically it puts it in the probability scale. All it really does is call inverse logic on the, um, you're muted again, right? Sorry, I, I, I didn't want to, I don't want to be distracting because my, my chair makes all this noise. Um, uh, I think it's, I think it's exponentiated predict. That's ah, cool. very good. Okay. So this does the, uh, the inverse logic, which is, you know, exponential. So that makes sense. Uh, the, of whatever comes out of limb predict essentially. I don't know what the code actually looks like, but it is the same exact thing as if you just call posterior limb predict and then did the inverse logic on all 4,000 of those, you'll get this thing, these 4,000 things. And it turns out that, you know, the mean, well, we can do the mean and standard deviation of these uh, 4,000 predictions. And we get that the mean value for the prediction for five is 0.5557, blah, blah, blah. You know, basically 55, 56%. When we now we also, now the advantage here is because we're doing the Bayesian thing, we can actually get a standard deviation on that as well, a standard error. 
of 0.03, which is kind of unlike a regular logistic regression, right? Uh, and unlike predict, right? Predict just gives a number, this number, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now we got that same number again. Notice here the same number. The number is the same because the mean of e predict is what predict is returning. Again, I don't know what's, how it's implemented, but that's it's evidently it's calculating the same thing, taking the mean of all those uh, results from e predict. Finally, there's another one more, one more prediction, posterior uh, predict. Now posterior predict goes all the way through the entire model and actually predicts ones and zeros, right? Um, so it'll predict 4,000 ones and zeros. These are actually samples from the full uh, model, right? Now, after you got the probability, now generate a random number and tell me whether that guy voted for um, Bush or would have wanted to vote for Bush or not. And again, the mean of that is gonna be 55.5, again, um, the same number, but these are posterior simulations of possible responses that could have been in your survey, right? Yeah. So those are, that's just quickly what all these, I mean, I think it's useful just to have this note noted down somewhere. I'm gonna save this page because to me, I always get confused about which of these different posterior predict things do what. Uh, of course, part, I, the one way to find out is just try them all. So you get to use the one that gives you what you want. But I, I, I get no, there's, you, yeah, and the documentation can help too, of course. But yeah, okay. So that's that part. Um, there's some. He says some more things in here uh, that I didn't include in my notes, which were kind of fun. Um, you know, logistic regression with just the intercept um, is equivalent to an estimate of proportion. That was kind of interesting and. Logistic regression with a single binary predictor is equivalent to a comparison of proportions. Yeah. I don't even remember the comparison of proportions. You know, there's some formula you have to remember. Well, if you can't remember, you could always just do this. <laughs> yeah. You could always just use this. But he was just showing, he didn't really demonstrate that as something, as he wasn't suggesting you should use logistic regression for these simple things. He was saying this is a, um, just to show you that it's equivalent. There's no reason to bring up the entire Monte Carlo Markov chain machinery to solve these problems since it is well known how to do it, but you can, and it gives the same answers. Okay, so this next section, which I thought was really interesting, was this, what he calls latent data formulation. And I have seen quite a bit in some more advanced uh, Bayesian things that these latent data concepts become, latent variables become very important. Um, concept in Bayes analysis. So it's, it's a great place to introduce it, I think, in the book. And that's kind of what the purpose of this section really is just to introduce this concept. So instead of doing uh, the logistic regression the way we think about before, now we can think of it as a, why are these dollar signs here? Anyway, we can think of it as uh, using some continuous unobserved latent variable Z, which is we have a linear model for, and then we map that, uh, uh, Z to our, and then the linear model includes some error term, some random error term. Right. Errors are independent. Let's worry about the distribution in a minute. But then when I get my Z, I find out whether the Y is one or zero by just if Z is positive, Y is one, if Z is negative, Y is zero, right? That's the model. And if the errors are independent and have this logistic distribution that we already talked about before, which is the derivative of that cumulative distribution, that um, uh, logic function, right? Then right. we have, the um, this is exactly the same as the what we've already been doing. The logistic regression is exactly the same. There's no difference at all. But one thing that's interesting is this looks kind of Gaussian. And the question is, well, what if I put in a Gaussian instead? Right. This is this is very close to a Gaussian with a, a standard deviation of 1.6. And so the question he raises is like, what if you just put in a Gaussian and let sigma be sigma and try to fit sigma two? Sigma, sigma as well, <laughs> right? Mm. Then what happens? And yeah. I thought, oh, that's really interesting because I often wondered about that. It turns out you can't do it because the sigma is non-identifiable because you can pick any sigma. There's a lot of typos in this page. Any sigma that you want, and you'll get the same exact predictions. Used by if you scale the slope and the intercept by the same amount, you scale sigma. And so sigma is you can if you try to do this, it won't actually work because sigma is a non-identifiable parameter. You'll get huge errors on. I didn't try it, but you'll get huge errors on. I actually don't know how to do it. I assume you'd have to use like R stand and not, you know, to do hmm. it, set up the model itself, right? Uh, so I guess I do know how to do it, but I didn't do it. So the question is, why would you ever bother with this business? Well, even with a fixed sigma, 
he gives kind of two reasons. One reason is sometimes you do have some information on the, on the latent variable. It's not so latent anymore. You may have some information about people's preferences on some kind of scale you can put in, right? Uh, and then it's not so latent. And the second thing he says, there's other uses for these latent variables uh, in later chapters. In particular, um, there's something called a probit regression, which uses a sigma equals to one instead. Mm -hmm. I guess there's some advantage. I don't know anything about it, but that comes up. It's, it's funny, is like I've taken a bunch of like categorical classes you know, over the years. Of course, I've learned logistic and I've and then probit yeah. talked about, and um, I immediately forget <laughs> like what, what it's about because it doesn't come up enough in my work. So, yeah, so I think that comes up in maybe chapter fifteen or something. I don't know. Um, anyway. And the other thing is for this category, ordered categorical variables. And it's interesting, I did a browse through chapter 15, he talks about how to do these ordered categorical. He really just gives a very short like uh, treatment, like a paragraph, he doesn't really do anything with it for unordered, which seems to be, isn't that the more common case, the unordered categorical variable, uh, which you'd normally use like a soft max regression for it, but- um, Talking about like a multinomial? Yeah, or... multinomial, so with a soft max uh, link. Uh, he doesn't talk about that in this book at all. So it might be something in the- volume two to be continued, or you can look it up somewhere else, but anyway. Hmm. So just, anyway, that point of that was that there's other uses for these latent um, variable formulations that will be coming up later. Yeah. So the next section, he takes a step back and uh, or step back into the mathematics of this. Like, okay, we've talked about this, but how do you actually do these fits, right? And there's two main approaches. One is the maximum likelihood method and the likelihood for this model which is the probability of the data given the parameters, right, is given by this ugly looking expression, which is really just nothing but, you know, the probability, inverse logic of X I beta is the, um, uh, what am I trying to say? It's the probability, right? So it's just P to the Y times one minus P to the one minus Y. And Y is here zero one. So you know, one of these terms are the other term, right? In the book, he actually also writes it as a two part thing. Uh, but that's just the likelihood. It's nothing, it looks complicated, but it's nothing really that complicated. Um, and you can say, okay, one approach is just to find the betas that maximize this. Like there's no analytic solution, but there's iterative techniques. Uh, the GLM library knows how to do this, for example. Uh, or I should say the GLM function does if you install also the ARM package. Um, now, the other approach is uh, Bayesian inference. Now, Bayesian inference with a uniform prior, flat prior, is exactly the same as maximum likelihood. He says, if you're going to do maximum likelihood, just do Bayesian inference with uniform priors because you'll get the same answers, but you get the benefit of getting those simulations. <laughs> and right. that's the maximum. Uh, but then he also says, but actually don't do that. <laughs> Use priors. Because <laughs> at the minimum, using some kind of priors, even if they're weakly informative, are going to be help regularize the model. It'll give you answers in cases where maybe the flat priors would have diverge and they would have diverged in an unrealistic way because they would have assumed possible parameters that are impossible that really aren't possible for your problem right okay. and he says stan glm uh by default uses these weekly this we've been doing all along we've only mainly been using these weekly informative priors whenever i type in stan glm without any priors it's just using weekly informal form eh, weekly informative priors and in the book he talks a little bit what these are um i didn't put it in here because you know you can look it up but uh Basically, the coefficients are given by a normal prior with a mean zero and a standard deviation is two and a half uh, times the standard deviation of the, uh, the, the x's or two and a half over the standard deviation of the, of the x's. And uh, the intercept is given some prior on the, uh, on the mean value, something based on the mean value of the data. I forget now. Let's see. We assign the prior to the linear predictor of each x set to the mean value of the data. Right, so right, so he doesn't do it to the the, the intercept directly. He does it to the centered intercept, okay? And that's standard practice. Actually, if you make your own models, you should always use the centered intercept. And then that's given a prior with mean zero, standard deviation two and a half. <laughs> that's the, the default prior. It doesn't really matter. The point is, it uses some weekly informative priors. And if you have problems with your fits, you, you might need to understand that. You can look at one thing you can do and should always do is look at your prior. Um, prior predictions, right, to prior distribution. We learned that in Bayes rules, so I don't know why I'm dwelling on it so much, but actually it's more kind of just trying to remind myself. <laughs> right. Yeah. So uh, anyway, the, um, 
So here he gives this interesting example comparing uh, the maximum likelihood with the Bayesian inference. And this, it's a simple model of a, just linear one, one uh, coefficient model, a plus bx. Uh, we set a equal to minus two and b equal to 0.8. Um, and he says that assume now that we have some information we do expect b, the slope, to fall somewhere in the range of zero to one. Not exactly, but somewhere in the range of zero to one. I don't expect it to be very far from that range. Okay. So he, does, he imposes a soft prior on that by putting a mean of 0.5 and a standard deviation of 0.5 on that. It's pretty soft, right? But at least it kind of regularizes a little bit so beta doesn't get too far, B doesn't get too far to control. And he just leaves the default prior for the intercept. And so we can, again, this is adapted from the tiny row RS uh, uh, repo. And so this is not my code, but it's good code though. <laughs> no. uh, and he just, you know, uses randomly distributed X's and then generates the Y's from this uh, logistic function, right? That's all. Uh, random logistic samples with this location and that scale, right? So uh, I think that's the default scale anyway. I'm not sure what scale does really, just probably have to look that up. Anyway. Oh, it's, um, I think it, it it's, um, well, it, it might be like a re re scoring the, the, you know, whatever the width of the, or the. Oh, okay, right. So it's not 1.6 yeah. standard deviation. No, I'm, 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 I'm totally guessing, but. Yeah, I think you're right though. And then we fit this. So this, oh, this is a big function, by the way. The, the reason for this function is so we can call it different numbers of uh, data points. Okay, so we can see the effect of having different numbers of data points. So it does a fit. Again, the standard thing, y is proportional to x, and there's a logic, there's a binomial family, everything else is normal. Everything else is the same except one change where we put in this prior. So now we, we constrain B by, you know, you remember how it works in Bayes rule, you just multiply by this. And then in the end, the posterior is gonna be multiplied by this prior, right? Um, he also does a, I'm sorry, I didn't mention it, but he also does here the GLM fit, not the standard GLM fit, which uses maximum likelihood as comparison. And then we display it, okay. So for N equals 10, cranks through, you get the, there's only 10 data points. Um, the general linear model, maximum likelihood method gives a, well, we're gonna concentrate on the slope here, gives a slope of 1.5. That's outside of what we thought was in our reasonable range. But of course, GLM doesn't constrain it at all, but it's also got a large coefficient, so it doesn't have much confidence in, uh, in that either with only 10, 10 data points. For the GLM, we get a, a value for the slope of 0 0.6 which is kind of dead bang in the middle of our prior, which makes sense because the only 10 data points doesn't really change our, um, the posterior very much. The prior is very strong, the informing in the case of only 10 data points. We go to hundred data points. Uh, the influence of the prior gets less. Again, this, uh, the error on this uh, slope goes down a little bit. It's still not within our initial expectations. So if we only had 100 data points, but we thought it was between, we're pretty sure it's somewhere between zero and one, we might be surprised by this, 1.2 from our fit. And by the way, you run this over and over, you get a different answer because it's pretty, it's only 100 data points still for this particular model. That's, uh, that's not very many, it turns out, and this area is pretty big, right? So you can get, you might do it again, you might get 0.7 or something like that, right? As for the slope on X from the GLM maximum likelihood. Mm -hmm. For the stand GLM, because it has that prior still constraining it quite a bit, and we get this estimate, uh, hmm. 0.6. Remember, the original, the actual number is 0 0.8, the real truth, right? Uh, so the prior is helping to bring this thing closer to the truth by, by regularizing in some sense, right? But it's not regularization just put in because we want regularization. It's because we know something about the slope of this thing prior. Right. And then finally, for 1,000 data points, well, now they both get kind of the same answer. One plus minus 0.2, that's well within the range of the uh, original 0.8. And 0.9 plus minus 0.2 is not really being influenced much by the prior anymore at all. You just kind of give the consistently a similar answer is the prior doesn't seem to matter very much anymore. So that's kind of like showing the, illustrating the, the advantages when you have more information of using it, I guess is one way to say it, right? That's right. what I got out of that. So that's my take my hot take on that section. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's see, this next section is on cross-validation and uh, log score, right? So this is this loose stuff that we had before. And it's kind yeah. of, you know, it's kind of uh, 
difficult a little bit, um, I would say. Not difficult, but it's a little more challenging the rest of the chapter because you have to put on your little brain again and think a little bit hard about these things. Right. Um, but essentially, he uses this log score, um, which is called the cross entropy, right? Um, but this is what's used for uh, when you count, when you call Lou. It calculates this, um, where p nu is the uh, predicted probability from the model, right? And why is the act? Why is either zero or one? It's the actual outcome. So it's really just summing up one or the other of these terms, depending on whether it's uh, the out, the actual outcome is a one or a zero, right? And, mm -hmm. and, the, and the terms being summed are the probability that that term, the log of the probability that that term would have would have been predicted, right? Mm -hmm. So let me say it a different way. Let's say y sub i was. Let's say we get. Let's, let's say we only have one new data point, <laughs> okay? Right. And it was a one, right? And my model predicted that with a probability of 0.7, then the answer for the log score would, for that would be would be just the first term here, because the second term would be zero, because one minus one is zero. And the answer would be the log of that probability. Right. On the other hand, if the actual result was a zero in that case, and I still say it was 0.7, it would be the log of 0.3 would be the log score. Right. So it's one minus p in that case. So what it does is it, it, higher numbers mean the data matches better, <laughs> right? Yeah. And this cross entry thing is used a lot in uh, for metrics for um, categorical data. Yeah. Okay, so uh, he says also for calibration purposes, if you have no info and you simply sign a p equals 0.5 to every single outcome, then both these terms are the same and you just get a log of half and it's the answer is minus, 0.693 times the number of data points, new data points. So this gives you kind of the lowest, the worst case, right? You got to do better than whatever this is. Remember, these are all negative numbers. So as you do better, you get more and more towards zero, right? So you get smaller negative number, I guess, you know, absolutely, in smaller and absolute value, right? Uh, so to calculate these things uh, on your models, you can use, you don't have any new data, but you can use the same thing we learned previously about leave one out cross-validation and we don't have to worry about implementing it because there's a function for that. The same function we've been using before, the LU. And I'm gonna give some examples of that in the next and final section of my notes, which is what I'm gonna do is instead of doing for 13.7, he goes to some example with Wells in Bangladesh, which is very interesting. I definitely mm -hmm. remember reading it. But instead, I wanted to look at exercise 13.1 because it actually can map into this pretty good, right? So exercise 13.1 is continuing on with this NES election data. And I'm gonna use the LU to try to compare different models uh, for this, kind of same trick we've done before in previous thing. So this is the full data again, I'm gonna read in the whole data. Uh, and then I picked out some things. Now, if you look at the data, you'll see there, I think there's like a, I don't know, 90 columns, <laughs> 90 predictors in this thing. It's a lot. Uh, 70, I guess. There it is. 70, 70 total columns. And I, a lot of them are not even clear what the heck they even are because they're very, like, very uh, abbreviated names. I did spend a little bit of time yesterday looking on the NES, the Harvard NES website where this data comes from. You can, there's like data books for it. But it's all very difficult for me to, I mean, required me to, I just didn't have time to go through because the data book itself doesn't use these same words, the same, doesn't use education, edu one, it calls it something else. And I'm trying to figure out what the mapping is. I just said, you know what, I'm not gonna worry about it. I'll pick some things which I'm pretty sure I know what they are. I know what our vote is because we already used that before. I'm gonna use the same uh, outcome as we did before, Republican vote versus Democrat vote. So age, age is age. So that's very straightforward. I know what that was. Female, that was a uh, indicator variable in the data set for female. That was obvious. Uh, black is a race indicator. There's another column called race. I couldn't make heads or tails of it other than to find out that certainly race two was, uh, I did some preliminary fitting and race two is a strong indicator. And race two also is the same as this uh, black, you know, uh, indicator variable. And then there is these three, I wanted to get education, or I thought it might be important, but there's three different education things and they're all different. So I just pulled them all in for now, right? They turn these things into factors. And then I looked at the, uh, the education things just to see, like do a little pair plot, see what, you know, which ones I could use, or which one, like, seems like education two and three are very similar. 
um, except something happens with that one of them doesn't, one has like seven levels and one has six levels and one has five levels, I guess, is what's happening here. So it's not exactly perfect correlation. Just to have something to do, I like combine two and three since they seem to have on the same scale and just took the average, you called it good for now. To really use this education thing properly, you should, I, should, I should probably go back and figure what these actually are, right? I mean, I wouldn't be, uh, I'm not happy with having to abandon a hope here and just combine them together in some new education parameter. That's what I did. It's a proxy for whatever education level is for now. I'm just going to treat it as a continuous variable, just like they did for income. I'm not very comfortable with that either. Should be right categorical variable of some kind, but this is what I'm going to do is just keep things manageable. So initially I picked some interactions I thought might be important. You might pick different ones. Um, I mean, this is not a complete uh, exhaustive research of this problem by any means. So I took the education, I took this race indicator, I took income, female, age, and took a couple of uh, interactions um, with race, interaction with income and uh, sex, right? And the usual thing, uh, the binomial length. Right. Ran the big model, right? Let's see what happens. And I get this, all this spit out uh, data, right? Uh, education, but I guess, I mean, it doesn't seem that important. Maybe it's not, maybe I haven't included the right predictor for this. I don't know. Race, uh, this particular race, uh, black seems to be a strong indicator of uh, preference for Democrats. Shouldn't be surprised. Income <laughs> is strong. Um, female female. turned to be, interestingly enough, strong that's, for the other way, which I don't know. Yeah, that's weird. <clears throat> um, age turned out to be not very important. And these are marginally important. This one's really not important at all. And income with, now this interaction turned out to be important. It might help explain this, uh, the female uh, thing by itself too, right? So we'll look at that in, uh, in a second in a little more detail. But first, there's the Lou I calculated. Oh, first I want to calculate this baseline Lou. Remember that's 0.693, you know, log of uh, half times the uh, number of rows. So that's the that's kind of the worst case. So I just guess, <laughs> right? Just guessing. I'm not gonna use any of the data. That's the that's how good that model is. Okay. How mm -hmm. good is my model for this using all these predictors? It's uh, better um, by you know. Again, these are again. I remind you that these numbers are not to be interpreted directly as, as anything else than not what they are, but um, there's they're not exponentiated yet, right? Right. This is the, uh, this log. Is the log. The log. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. This is seven point seven twenty eight, and that is um, you know higher and significantly higher. The standard error on that estimate is twelve, so significantly higher than the baseline. So we're definitely doing a lot better job than the baseline on this prediction, right? Uh, so now I'm going to simplify. Take, I'm just going to drop out most uh, everything but the female income. The female income seemed to be important to help understand the female things. I left that one in, and I left out uh, education, which I spent a lot of time messing around with. It turns out wasn't that important. Just to try a different model, and in this model I fit it, and I get you know just taking a quick look at the parameters. Age. Uh, I left age in because I feel like it should be important, but just not really doing much of a job here. But, but, it's, but it's also just on a yearly basis, right? Yeah, so, it's true. I very should scale the age. I wonder what, what is income scaled to? Like, you know, it can't be a dollar. It can't be. A no, no, income, remember, income is one, two, three, four, five. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's the, yeah. 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 So age is like, this is by year, right? So it might be more important than, I should probably have done that. What do you call it? Divide by the mean or something like that. Um, Try the standard deviation or something to scale the age better, but, or maybe just divide by 10 might help, right? By 20, I don't know. Anyway, it, but the error on it's big, so I'm not, I didn't really go back and look at that any further. But you're right, that's maybe should be, I, that would have been a good idea. I should have done that. Because we just learned about that and I completely forgot about it. So good point. Excellent. So uh, yeah, probably, I, maybe you already said this. Sorry, I, I just looked, I, I just got a message right now, but oh, probably for the income, you could you could just dummy code income and then like leave whatever the lowest one is the reference. And then that's true too. That would be a little bit easier to interpret. Yeah. yeah. Although I don't know, maybe it's not worth it because it is linear, like if it in terms of an increase. Yeah. So I did the loop for that one. It's 727. So it's actually a little, only a little, it's almost the same. So the things I left out didn't matter, it turns out. The loo is unaffected by that, which is interesting, right? So that's good. <laughs> I left out the right things, I guess. That one interpretation of that. I don't know. That's how I interpret it. Um let's see. Let's try even simpler. So I'm gonna leave out that age thing I gave up on age. <laughs> um, now everything that's left looks 
good, right? Now, again, I remember because you're not just supposed to throw out things because they don't look, they're not significant. And I, I hesitate to throw out age. So I, I'm now thinking about if I were to do this again, I would leave age in, but scale it better. Um, but at this point, I look at the loo and it's, it's not, you know, it's actually a little bit better. So I was overfitting a little bit, perhaps. So it's actually a little bit better uh, when I leave the age out. I left out something else too, didn't I? What did I leave out? I forgot. Oh, I also left out education. I thought I, I thought I, oh, I thought I already did leave out education, but now I finally give up on education and age both. So the only thing we're working on here in Fit Three is the, the race. In fact, only black income, female, and then this interaction between female income. That interaction looked interesting to me, so I left it in there. Um, you know, I have a plot that I'll show you in a moment that might help explain that a little better. Finally, I did one more, just leaving out the interaction, right? I just want to see, is that interaction significantly important? So I left it out, and I do a loo now with all of them. The four is the last one I did where I left out the interaction. It turns out that, that this is a loo compare now. Leaving out the interaction is a bad idea, I guess. It's, it's you know, it's point it's a three but that fit three was my best right and simplest so this even though it's you know there's not a, a huge a significant difference between fit two and fit three in terms of loo right the fact that it's simpler means i want to use fit three in my mind because it's 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 actually better not maybe not significantly better but at least it's the best one and it's the simplest that's great well it's not the simplest the simplest is fit four but fit four is significantly barely but significantly worth you know not that much worse, but one air bar worse, but still, um, I like fit three because I do have that interaction and it seemed to make some difference. And it's not that much more complicated to have the interaction in there, right? So I, the last part of this thing, part C is, okay, I'm looking, I picked fit three, that's my fit. Remember that's um, female, black, income and female income interaction. And you might pick different things. I didn't spend hours on this. I just whipped through this pretty quickly. Um, and if I really were interested in this, I would also want to look at understand the education better, go through and look at and spend like the day and a half it might take to understand that code book. I don't know what it would take. But I'm not doing that. It's not my interest. Uh, oh, we're running out of time. So I just did a, this uh, one thing. I, I don't know. By the way, do you know a better way to do this? I wanted to create a tibble that had a column for all the different possibilities, right? Income, female, and, uh, and black, right? And so I just did it by hand with this crunchy, you know, stupid labor intensive way of like just constructing these rep things. You can do it with like, there's like a grid um, ah. function. I forget what it's grid. Um, That's a good tip. Yeah. yeah. I forget what it's called, but um, yeah, it, it just does all possible comparisons and whatnot. All right. So good. Thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah. I'll try to remember that. So just for fun, I plotted um the fit lines without any air bars on the fit lines at all just the just the mean fit lines for female versus income right uh vote sorry vote versus income for female and male and you can see that there is a, this interaction seems important and that the slope is quite different right for the female they seem to be less affected by income they they tend to be uh their vote preferences has a lower impact with income which i thought was interesting right where the males the, the rich males <laughs> are more likely to say, hey, uh, you know what? <laughs> I want to keep my money. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. And that maybe, I don't know. I mean, I could probably make some kind of sexist remarks about why that should be, and I won't do that. So right. I'm not sure I believe them anyway. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's kind of what happened there. But you can see that, in fact, when we were saying before that the male versus female, that the in some cases, if you didn't control for this, control for, that's that word, if you didn't have this interaction in there, then you would, I, you, I saw that the females, what did I see that? What did I say? Females, uh, no, so females prefer the slightly prefer, you know, maybe, or being female seems to slightly push you in the direction of preferring the Democrat. But here you can see it actually depends on income level. For low income, uh, the, the, uh, the females prefer slightly more likely to prefer Republican here, right? Again, there's large error bars on it, so I don't know if that's any significant stuff, but it's just, I thought it was interesting. Because mm -hmm. you remember before the slope, the actual intercept, as it were, for the, actually, I, that's a good point. I don't I hate to do belay, go back to because that confused me at first. This right here, right? What does this actually mean, right? That's sort of the intercept, though, for, <laughs> for the female slope thing, right? It's the case of um, income zero. For income zero, what's the female uh, 
what's the effect of, of being female? That's what that means. So that's not really important. You shouldn't even look at that number. It's not, it's not an interpretable yeah. thing. But here we can see the real impact in terms of as, as on the slope. So income zero is down here somewhere. That's where that, that, that coefficient comes. And we did talk about that in the previous chapter. And I have to go back and look at that again to see the right way to handle that. Because I kind of forgot. You know yeah. what I'm talking about though, right? When you have an interaction, yeah, like that. What about an interaction? Sorry, what, what do you mean? So, is this that, that, is there anything else interesting? No, this is the only thing that's really interesting on the plots that I did. Uh, the point was when you look at this, right? Yeah, oh, it's hard to tell like what, what the shape of the interaction right. is. Or, yeah, because right, I have this, you say, oh, being female strongly influences you toward wanting to vote for uh, Republicans. Well, no, that's not true. This is for income zero. <laughs> By the way, what does that um, mean? that's not even a real income. By the way, uh, because you have interaction terms, you really can't even interpret the main effects things. Yeah, like, we much. talked about that in the previous chapter. But I kind of forgot about it because when I yeah. first saw that, I'm like, wait a minute, what? I don't care. Yeah, and, and in fact, like it probably, I don't know. I mean, you could probably look at run like VIF, you know, statistics or whatever, but you've got like black in two interaction terms. I mean, it's just a lot of, and then it's like a main effect. Yeah. That's, that's probably eating up a bunch of. Yeah, I dropped those though. So power. that's not the right model to look at anyway. This is the one right here. Yeah. Yeah. This is the one I mean right here. So that so yeah. This is the main model. This is my favorite model right here. Right. So the inter interact interpreting this one, you have to be like you said, you can't really interpret that. Yeah. Hey, I got a dash here. Oh, we're done. We're Let's done. Go. So I appreciate Here's you. Here's my thought. It up. Um uh for next week, would you be willing to Looking fourteen point three. It's just that you know, it's a, some of these are kind of wonky or kind of like conceptual questions, but this is like a pure data question. Fourteen point three. Yeah. Exercise. Yeah. yeah. I'm yeah, happy to do that. Yeah, do that, and I'll I'll get the other ones, and I you mean, know, and I'll um, is that because it really all we're going to be talking more about is interactions and yeah. um, I don't know, yeah, a bunch of other stuff, but anyway, I got a dash, but I yeah. will, I will, I will see Thanks you next for... week. All right, see you next week. See ya.